Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today I'd like to continue talking about Beach Boy album covers of the early 70s. This will be album covers part six, really part five and a half, because I had intended to talk about all four of the early 70s Warner Reprie's studio album covers in the last episode, but I could see we were going to run out of time, so this is really like part five and a half. Last time we had gotten through talking about Sunflower and Surf's Up. And before we continue with Carl and the Passions and Holland, I'd like to back up and talk a little bit about how Surf's Up was received. The album came out at the end of August 1971, got good reviews, good fan reaction. It seemed that new manager Jack Riley's intention to make the Beach Boys hip again was really working. They began to get very valuable play on FM radio, and at the end of October of 71, they were on the front cover of the then very hip Rolling Stone magazine to begin a two-part article called The Beach Boys' California Saga. The fact that the Rolling Stone article was called California Saga made me wonder, is that a term that is unique to the Beach Boys or did it originate someplace else? Of course, on the Holland album a year and a half later, the Beach Boys would title a series of tracks California Saga. But I wondered, was California Saga something that had been applied elsewhere? Was it a collection of John Steinbeck stories? It sounds like it could have been something like that. I googled it and the only things I could come up with for California Saga were in reference to the Beach Boys. So did they title these songs after the Rolling Stone article or is it sheer coincidence? Anyway, just made me wonder about that phrase California Saga. Certainly the numbers told the story on Surf's Up. Where Sunflower had reached 151 on the U.S. album chart, Surf's Up went to 29. So a vast improvement in sales for their second Warner Reprise album. So the release of the Surf's Up album had succeeded in giving the Beach Boys some much needed hipster cred. Also their reputation as a live act was growing. That was helping as well. So they had some momentum going into 1972. In May of 1972, for the first time in many years, they released their new album ahead of a summer tour. That album, of course, was Carl and the Passions, So Tough. With Carl and the Passions, they were following a trend that went back at least as far as the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper, of bands sort of vaguely portraying themselves as a different band. Of course, there was Mothers of Invention as Reuben and the Jets in 1968. 68, 69, you had the Kinks are the Village Green Preservation Society. Very recently, you had had the release of Eric Clapton and bands Derek and the Dominoes, Layla and other assorted love songs. And though it wouldn't be very big in America for a number of years, the month following the release of the Carl and the Passions album, you had David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust, and the Spiders from Mars. Carl and the Passions, of course, was a name that had been kicked around early in the Beach Boys' career, not probably very seriously around the time they were calling themselves the Pendletones and trying to come up with a name. They did apparently come up with Carl and the Passions. The original album does not feature the words the Beach Boys anywhere on the cover, though the original release did feature a hype sticker that indicated that this was a record by the Beach Boys. Apart from the title, the only writing on the front cover is the small illustration credit Willardson right here. David Willardson was at the beginning of a very long and very distinguished career as an illustrator. David Willardson began illustrating album covers around 1968 and his very early work is very much in the West Coast psychedelic style. A breakthrough came for him in 1970 with the album cover for Pacific Gas and Electric's Are You Ready album and its highly symbolic cover. After that, he began to specialize in an airbrushed pinstripe style that was at once modern looking and also retro. Good example is the cover of the American Graffiti soundtrack album. He also did covers for Ike and Tina Turner's Nutbush City Limits, The Carpenters, Made in America, and in the mid 80s, Motley Crue's Theater of Pain album. David Willardson has reputedly done over 150 album covers, so obviously that's just a very small sampling. But where his real success has come is in movie posters. In the early 80s, he designed the logo for Raiders of the Lost Ark, and later on began a very long and very successful relationship with Disney, designing and giving a new look to movie posters for such films as Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, and Beauty and the Beast. 
I love the retro look of the cover and it fits right in with the retro title, Carl and the Passion So Tough. I like up here how you've got the beach umbrellas and the palm trees reflected in the car glass, invoking Southern California kind of subtly. And there was a big trend, of course, at this time to go back before the hippie era. I think even hippies had nostalgia for the pre-hippie era. And a lot of bands were sort of making a nod to that pre-mid-60s style. And that's what this record indicates. Unfortunately, that's not what the music on the album is. This would be a great cover for something like 15 Big Ones. This album cover, pleasant though it is, is not indicative of the music that's contained within. Even worse for the presentation of Carl and the Passions was the fact that, as the hype sticker indicated, this is a two-record set. But the second record is Pet Sounds. Warner Reprise had gotten the rights to all the Beach Boy Capital albums, Pet Sounds through 2020, and was eager to make use of them. They released Pet Sounds as a standalone in a brownish cover. As mentioned in an earlier episode, in 1974, Warner Reprise released Smiley Smile and Friends and Wild Honey and 2020 as twofers in packages that bore no resemblance to their original releases. This is probably why, in 1974, Capitol's album, Endless Summer, concludes pre-1966. The rest of the material at that time was with Warner Reprise. I am not the first, nor will I be the last, to ask the question, what the hell were they thinking to package Pet Sounds with Carl and the Passions? I'd like to give you my impression of what I think the average record buyer might have been like in May of 1972 when they first spotted this package in a record store. Hey, it's a new Beach Boy album, follow-up to Surf's Up, and it's a double. Wow, it's, it's Pet Sounds. Wait, hey, can I get this without Pet Sounds? I already have Pet Sounds. I can't? I have to buy Pet Sounds again? Oh well, all right, I'll think about it. And I think that's the way it went. When I first began collecting Beach Boy albums, I spent several months looking for what I thought must have been the original release of Carl and the Passions as a single album, only to realize that the initial release was packaged with Pet Sounds. At the very least, it shows a lack of faith in the material on Carl and the Passions. It makes you think it must be second rate if they're trying to bolster it by including Pet Sounds. It also compares very unfavorably between the two albums, which are very different. If you do get the album home, you get a nice gatefold with a photo of the band with two new guys, Blondie Chaplin and Ricky Fatar, who also wrote two of the songs included on the album. As beloved as Ricky and Blondie are by most Beach Boy fans now, at this point they were new guys, and it probably was a bit of a letdown at the time, the two of the songs were written by people that, at the time, were unknown outsiders. Also, Bruce Johnston is missing, which must have raised questions among some Beach Boy fans at the time. What's more, this photo is an edit. Carl and the Passions, to this point, was the album in which Brian Wilson had the least involvement of all. And Brian's photo was edited into this group photo to make it appear more as if he is a participating member of the band. Where Surf's Up had reached 29 on the album chart, Carl and the Passion So Tough only reached number 50 in the U.S. In the U.K., where it was released as a standalone album, it did a little better. It reached number 25, although Beach Boy albums generally did better in the U.K. anyway. The follow-up to Carl and the Passions came relatively quickly, particularly considering all the changes the Beach Boys went through, including moving their entire recording operation, lock, stock, and barrel, to Bombrugge in Holland, which is 14 kilometers southeast of Amsterdam. In January of 1973, we got the release of the aptly titled Holland Album. The cover has a very subdued look to it for a Beach Boy cover, lots of grays and browns with the boat and building abstracted in the water by printing the photo upside down on the cover. Long before I ever had an opportunity to visit Holland myself, I was always struck by how dark the colors and how diffuse the light was in Dutch painting. Things like Franz Hals, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Bruegel, all seem to have lots of browns, lots of very diffuse light, lots of grays, and it's reflected in the cover. 
When I finally did visit Holland myself, I realized that's just how things look there. So this cover is very representative, has a real Holland feel to it. It is kind of interesting to see the cover of Holland right side up and take a good look at the undistorted view of the photo. All the photos, front and back, are credited to Russ Mackey, the group's traveling attaché, who also did some of the photos on the insert for the Surf's Up album. So this is more of a sort of homemade affair than the Beach Boys albums had been for a while. The back cover features a photo of a cow pasture. The Beach Boys recording studio in Holland was reputedly next door to a cow pasture. And the individual pictures of the Beach Boys tend to give the impression of a hard-working band on the road, which is just what they were at the time. Also next to each individual picture, we get the writing credits showing that this is a group effort and that each member is a composer in their own right. You did also get a surprise bonus when you picked up the Holland album at the time, which was a little more welcome than having to buy pet sounds again as you had to with Carl and the Passions. With Holland, you initially got the Mount Vernon and Fairway single taped to the back. You can still kind of see, or I can still kind of see anyway, the residue of the tape where it was held inside the shrink wrap, taped right here to the back of the Holland album originally. This, of course, was Brian Wilson's main contribution to the album, the Mount Vernon and Fairway fairy tale, and he also drew this artwork for the outer sleeve of the EP that came with the Holland album. As with the other Warner Reprise Beach Boys albums up to this point, there's a lot of recording specs included on the liner notes. And over here, there's an interesting credit I'd like to see if anybody knows more about. It says, Crickets, John Ruse. I tried Googling John Ruse and couldn't come up with anybody that seemed like they would have provided crickets to the Beach Boys on the Holland album. With the Holland package, the Beach Boys gave us another interesting and intriguing record cover. The kind of thing that drew us in and sort of challenged our expectations of what a Beach Boy album might be. The album did very well, largely on the strength of the single Sail on Sailor. It went to number 36 in the U.S., number 20 in the U.K., and unsurprisingly did even better in Holland, where it went to number 9. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this interesting. Please comment. Love to hear what you have to say about this. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.